Welcome again to Astronomy Days and welcome to this presentation. And before we get started, I do want to introduce our speakers. So my name is Miranda Dowdy and I'm gonna be the host. So if you have any questions, um, I might interrupt our guests to um, ask them, um, but otherwise you're just gonna be hearing from these two amazing women. Um, we have Mary Frazier and she has 30 years of experience as a biologist working on everything from wetlands to coastal management. For the last 20 years, she's worked extensively on endangered species in North Carolina. She's a board member of the Wake Audubon and co-chair of a North Carolina bat working group and works at Three Oaks Engineering. And first we're gonna hear from Lena Galatano and she is a native of here of Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And since retiring, Lena has devoted much of her time to Audubon and other organizations related to birds, birding and the environment. She has served on the boards for both Wake Audubon and Audubon, North Carolina. And she has volunteered for many projects, including the North Carolina Birding Trail, Wings Over Water, and various Wake Audubon Society projects, including Lights Out. So um, they are coming with lots of experience. So if you have any bird questions in general, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer those at the end of the presentation. And we are excited to hear about um, birds and lights and light pollution and how that relates to astronomy as well. So Lena, I'm gonna go ahead and let you take it away and share your screen. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, Miranda. And uh, we also want to thank the museum for the invitation and for the support of Wake Audubon Society uh, meeting space because the museum allows us to meet in the Nature Research Center when we are meeting in person. And hopefully that will be sooner rather than later. But anyway, tonight we want to talk about stars, lights, and birds. Oh, wait a minute, I'm having trouble advancing. Yeah, you may have to click first and then you can use your arrow keys on your keyboard. Okay. Um, okay, there we go, thank you. Um, here in Raleigh um, and in other locations, most bird species that we have are actually residents, um, but we see quite a few species that complete seasonal migrations. Um, and right now they are here for the winter and uh, those visitors include birds such as kinglets, juncos, and white-throated sparrows among others. So this is a, a migration flyaway map uh, indicating some of the, uh, areas or flyways that birds use when they migrate. Um, in, in North Carolina, the traditional fall migration is along the coast or maybe a little bit further out, um, but they head south um, and there's less headwind there. So it's often makes ease, flying a little bit easier, um, but they're flying an Eastern route and then they may winter in South America, Central America, maybe in uh, some of the islands in the Bahamas, um, but a lot of different places. But in the spring, they're going to head back North and they may come a little bit further inland um, so that they're heading um, North with a stronger tailwind, um, but it's more a Western pattern often over the Caribbean. So in, in reality, they probably are doing a circular pattern, something like this. Um, so um, our birds um, migrate for two primary reasons. Um, the first is food resources, because our foods change seasonally. As you know, there are no flowers in Raleigh right now, and there are not a whole lot of insects either. We do have a lot of seeds and nuts right now, but things like hummingbirds can't eat those um, eat those things. So they are moving south to find food that they can use. The other thing they do when they change directions and come back north, they're again looking for seasonal food sources, but they're also looking for insects and plant buds that they feed their young because um, they need a lot of different things. And we, are, we have all of those things for them in uh, North America when the seasons change. But how do birds know when to migrate? It's partially genetic because over millions of years, they have developed a biological clock that gives them that, that information. The other thing is that they're looking for food. Geography also plays a part in it. 
And the other response is to weather systems. With a low counterclockwise wind, that would help them in the um, um, spring migration and clockwise would help them with a the tailwind in the fall migration. And of course, the other big thing that we noticed too with seasonal changes is the day length. One of the migration clues is the biological clock, however, and seasonal hormonal changes. Studies have shown that even caged birds that would typically migrate are more agitated and face in the direction of the season's migration when their migration time comes. Large birds, swans, ducks, and geese may migrate in the daytime but many of our smaller songbirds are going to migrate at night because there are a lot of advantages to that. One is the air is cooler and less turbulent at the altitudes where they fly. There are fewer predators. The sunset also provides directional information uh, because of the polarized light patterns that the birds can see even when the sun is not visible. And the stars are of course more visible. So after a night of flying, birds are going to land in early morning and use the daylight to forage and refuel for the next leg of the journey. Chickadees and local birds singing at dawn often help migrants find local, bird, local food sources. That's probably why that Carolina wren sings so loud in the morning to welcome everybody back to my yard. At sunset, birds launch, climb some thousands of feet to altitude, and fly, but migration is not without preparation in advance. Some good example, and a good example of that is America's smallest warbler, which is a black pole. It's just about the size of our Carolina chickadee, but it stops in the Northeast to forage for days or even weeks to double its weight. It takes off over the ocean. It flies as long as 72 hours over the Atlantic to winter in South America and it often arrives weighing less than it did when it departed. That's really not a weight loss program I would recommend. Sunset and the sun's movement gives the first clue that once, but once airborne, there are other clues um, that birds can use to migrate. They read the stars and studies suggest they learn their north-south orientation from star patterns, but also they have an internal magnetic compass for both orientation and slope as magnetic strength increases and dips towards the pole. So they can, the orientation is north-south and the slope is up and down toward the poles. But even with the stars and their internal migrant, uh, magnetic compass, birds have some challenges. For 4.5 billion years, at least, um, there was no artificial light on Earth and biological systems evolved under natural circles, uh, natural cycles of light and dark. But let's fast forward to today. The planet is awash in light from street lights to landscapes and more. It's estimated that more than 99% of the people in the United States live under a haze of light pollution. The International Dark Sky Association is one of the leading world authorities on light pollution. And I'd like to share a bit of information from their vast knowledge, but I would highly recommend you check out their website. Light pollution um, interrupts our natural light dark cycle and many of the impacts are negative. For example, it interrupts the sleep cycles of humans and it impacts our health. Migration patterns for birds are interrupted. Hibernation for mammals and maybe bears are interrupted. And it can also change the flowering time for plants and for the hatch times insects that birds depend on for food and that plants depend on for pollination. Science also tells us that for birds, man-made elect electromagnetic waves created by the sum flow of all of our electricity, such as TVs, computers, battery chargers, lights, and more, may disrupt their ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field they use for migration. So it's not just direction and patterns, it's just also the interruption, but lights are only one of those factors. During migration, we know that sunrise comes and migrants land to refuel and rest. So let's next look at how we can see what they might find on the ground. 
In general, birds have excellent vision, but it varies between species, between an eagle and a tufted titmouse, which is this bird here on the right. Um, but the colors that they see are uh, the colors we see, but also ultraviolet light. In addition to the light, they can track fast motion and some see as much as 360 degrees at once in peripheral vision with multiple focal points. And you can see here, these little birds are looking at the camera, but their eyes are really looking to the side. So let's compare a human field of view to birds. We humans see straight ahead with binocular vision. Both eyes see the same image. But bird's sharpest vision is to the side. They're always looking from one eye. They process the images from both eyes at the same time to tell them what they should do. Robins are foraging uh, on the ground and you see them tip their heads to look for a worm because they're looking out of one eye sideways at the ground and then they pounce on that worm. Owls like humans face forward, but they can turn their heads three fourths of the way around for hunting. And birds process images they see about two times faster than people do. So in comparison, we see in slow motion when bird, as opposed to birds. This vision gives them the ability to hunt and to avoid predators. However, one shortcoming is this wide view, from, for this wide view is the forward view. Many birds don't see what's in front of their beak. So looking here, this is a tree swallow. And you can see it's looking at the camera, but its eyes really are looking off to the side. This is a baby Carolina wren, and this is a titmouse. And their eyes are off to the side rather than straight ahead. So maybe that's why it's really hard to take a picture of a bird um, straight ahead, because most of the time we just see a profile. But color vision is another dramatic difference between humans and birds. The eyes of both humans and birds have some things in common. We both have cones and that senses colors and we both have rods and that senses light. But humans have about 5% color sensing cones and 95% dark light vision, while birds have about 80% color sensing cones. And you can see the difference here on what a bird might see uh, and what we see. And some of this is because there's one more detail that makes this difference possible, and that is ultraviolet light. We have similar, similar eye structures, excuse me, similar eye structures, but there are some significant differences. You can see here with this diagram, this is what a, a bird sees. They see these wavelengths down in the UV range, while humans see from here, uh, in the blue range up to red. And you can see in this rainbow, that's all we can see, but the birds probably would see something different. But we both have cones and rods. And the thing that's interesting to me is that we have, uh, we all have three cones to detect blue, green, and red, but birds have a fourth cone so they can detect this UV range that's down here at the bottom of the wavelength. As a result, you can see here that there's a much wider range of color vision, and that's very important for birds, both in mate selection, but also in finding food sources. Hummingbirds are a good example of the use of color to find foods as they're always looking for red flowers. Knowing that birds use UV light gives um, us some clues on how we might help birds uh, in our built environment. If they see images and both eyes that come together from various directions. Um, they have a lot of information about flying, but residents birds learn where the buildings are and migrants are not so familiar with the locations they find themselves in after a really long migration night. So how might we incorporate products in our homes and buildings to help birds see what is now invisible glass to them? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. One bird uh, migration issue we know a lot about, however, is lighting. This is a classic example of migration interference of lights. And this is the annual tribute in light at the site of the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center. This annual September 11th display is during fall migration for many songbirds. 
The lights attract migrating birds. It disorients them so they fly in circles in the light and it disrupts their migration route. You can see the birds that are reflected here in the lights up here at a higher level, probably above the building tops in New York City. Um, there are lots of little dots and each one of those dots is a bird. And down here, there are fewer because they are flying among the buildings in the city. Audubon, uh, New York saw this was happening and worked for a solution with the organizers of the tribute. It turns out that if you, they turn the lights out for 20 minutes when they see birds gathering and the birds, um, if they turn out the lights for 20 minutes when they see the birds gathering, the birds will continue on their way. Otherwise, they might continue to fly in circles until they're exhausted. So this is an interesting detail on that. Um, on September 11th, 2015, um, New York Audubon uh, and some scientists took radar images to reveal how, bird, how birds were aloft in the city. So here on the right, you will see that the lights were on and within that beam of light, within a half a kilometer, there were 15,700 birds on the radar images. When the lights had been turned off, so this was at 1032, the lights were turned off at 1012, or turned on off at, <laughs> from 1012 to 1032, 20 minute difference. When the lights were off, there were only 500 birds within that half a kilometer. So it's really an amazing um, experience to, to see the difference um, of what just the lights for 20 minutes can do. So when the lights are off, the birds would continue their normal um, migration routes. And they have adopted this policy every year um, at the Tribute of Light to allow birds safe passage to move through New York City. So understanding this behavior can give us some ideas on how we might take action uh, to mitigate something like this in our own neighborhood. So if you're a bird, where do you land at first light in our lighted city? Hopefully there's a park with some trees, but maybe not. Perhaps there's a tree reflection on a window in the early morning light, or a plant is in the lobby by the window and the lights are on, but then there is that clear invisible glass. In 2013, when Wake Audubon was first approached about seriously looking at the impact of our lighted environment and its impact on birds, we began surveys in Raleigh. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mary to let her tell you the rest of the story. Hi everyone. Hi. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, before I started, I wanna give a big shout out to Lena. Uh, first of all, for spearheading this whole presentation tonight, but also for the work she's done on this uh, whole Lights Out survey I'm gonna be talking about and all the other things she's done uh, to help birds. Um, thank you for that. So uh, to figure out what was happening to migrating birds as they passed through Raleigh, Wake Audubon Society surveyed downtown during migration to look for fallen birds on this two mile route showing on the map. We were hoping to see how buildings might be affecting migratory birds. A survey consisted of walking the route at dawn to look for dead or stunned birds. We ran a lot of surveys and on average, we found uh, only one or two birds at each time. The most common species was the common yellow throat followed by white-throated sparrow. The most birds found on a single survey was seven. The vast majority, majority of birds were migratory, like oven birds, cuckoos, ruby-throated hummingbirds, and chimney swifts. These birds are not ones you'd normally find hanging around downtown. They all prefer forested habitat. We did not find a lot of bird building collisions, um, but we definitely did find some. Uh, but keep in mind that houses cause half of the bird collisions in the US a year. So our survey results are just the tip of the iceberg. Using the data from the survey, Lena worked with building owners, especially the city of Raleigh, to encourage them to turn off their lights at night, particularly during migration to minimize bird mortality. As a result of the lights out surveys, the city agreed to turn off or reduce lights at city owned buildings downtown. So community science can make a difference. 
Here is what we asked participating buildings to do. Uh, architectural lighting, those are the ones that shine on trees or shine upward on the exterior of a building. Interior lights, those are needed for cleaning staff, but once they're done and nobody's left in a building, it should be an easy thing to turn off the lights at night. Uh, moving plants away from windows can also help since birds see the plants and they think it might be vegetation they can land on. What scientists have learned over the la last few decades is that glass and lights kill hundreds of millions of birds each year in the US alone. Uh, this is the number one killer of birds, uh, not counting cats. Um, birds collide with windows at all hours of the day and night. At night and in the early morning, migrating birds can be distracted by bright lights in cities, while during the day, window reflections can confuse birds. So the bird in this picture is a yellow-bellied sapsucker. Not all birds are killed instantly when they hit a window. Uh, they've got really strong, flexible necks, so they don't break their necks. Uh, some birds are actually able to fly away after a collision, but they can die later on from brain damage. This particular bird in the picture had skull damage, and if you can look closely there at the picture, you can also see it broke the tip of its beak. So even if the bird had survived the collision, uh, it would have been unable to eat. So how can we as individuals make our homes and buildings safer for birds? Turning out or minimizing lights at homes can make a difference. Lights can be important for safety, but there are ways to reduce the amount of light spill into other areas. Or you can use motion detector lights, which are very effective for safety, but they aren't on all the time. Birds collide with glass because they see the world differently than people do. Uh, as Lena was pointing out when she was showing those birds earlier, small birds with eyes off to the side, they've got very poor depth perception uh, right in front of them. Windows appear to be habitat they can fly into, whether that habitat is reflected or is visible through the glass. In addition to turning out lights, other things can reduce bird collisions. Uh, resources for reducing bird collisions can be seen at the American Bird Conservancy's website. These include ways for making windows more visible, how, design, how to design architecture that's safer for birds, and proposed legislative language. Window screens, uh, the kind that people put on the outside of their window to keep bugs out, those can be effective for preventing window collisions, as can paint or decals on the glass or lines of string hanging down in front of the glass. Keep in mind these things need to be on the outside of the glass and spaced closely together. Too small for a bird to squeeze through and that's about two inches by four inches. Uh, something else you can do is if you've got a bird feeder, uh, move it close to your window. That way birds will fly to the feeder and it won't have a whole lot of speed built up uh, if they try to go through the window. Okay, so here's one of the things the American Bird Conservancy and Audubon Society are promoting, bird-friendly building design by working with the Green Building Council. This can include modifying glass reflectivity, color, texture, or opacity. This website is from FLAP, the Fatal Light Awareness Program, which is dedicated to safeguarding migratory birds in the built environment through education, policy development, research, rescue, and rehabilitation. If you are on this page and scroll down to the bottom, you can find a self-assessment to see if your home or workplace is safe or not for birds. On the upper left corner of this page, there is a link to the next page where you can actually report collisions that you might find yourself. So this, this is the bird collision mapper which is used to document bird building collisions worldwide. Each year, people take to the streets to search for birds that have collided with buildings, using social media to raise awareness about this conservation issue and making their own windows bird safe. You can go to this website and report where birds have collided with buildings. Wake Audubon has a team you can join on this site. So if you go here, please look for us. Uh, with enough data, it's possible to determine where birds need the most help. If you actually find stunned birds that are in need of help, the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission website has a list of wildlife rehabilitators. 
So to wrap up, bird migration is an amazing seasonal phenomenon with millions of birds flying hundreds or even thousands of miles to reach breeding or wintering grounds. Many return to the exact same location year after year. Birds use the sun, stars, and electric magnetic fields, among other things, to help navigate during migration. Hazards from lights and the built environment pose significant threats along the way. I enjoy the Raleigh skyline, but as Wake Audubon has found in our surveys, the buildings are not always friendly to birds, especially on foggy nights during migration. One solution that helps bird is a simple one, turn out the lights, especially between 11 p.m. and dawn. Many cities, counties, and states are, are implementing sustainability initiatives to turn off lights, which helps address climate change and reduces energy use. These actions present opportunities to integrate lights out programs and dark sky initiatives to protect the ecological function of our cities at night. So this is how you can help prevent bird strikes. Uh, take the self-assessment, go to flap.org and take the assessment to see if your home or business is bird friendly. Homeowners can do a lot to help reduce collisions for birds. Talk to building managers about turning off lights, especially those that aren't needed for safety. This next spring and fall, look around for birds that have struck buildings. And if you see any, be sure to report them on the bird collision mapper. Check out the American Bird Conservancy website for legislation to promote buildings constructed with bird-friendly designs. Uh, and as can, you can see here on number four, there is a Bird Safe Buildings Act um, that we need to get senators to support. So uh, call your politicians maybe. Thanks very much for watching our uh, presentation. We've got the Wake Audubon website posted here. Come check us out. We have speakers giving talks every two, the second Tuesday of every month. And you can find our calendar of events, including socially distanced bird walks on our website. So please attend. Um, we'll take questions now, but be before we do, we'll flip back to the last slide so you can take another look about how you can help prevent bird strikes. So who's got questions? All right, so someone early in the program um, asked that, I think it would maybe have been one of the first images that Lena had up on the PowerPoint um, of the, the migration pathways. And someone was wondering what the black and white dots meant. And I know Mary thought it was Maybe summer birds versus winter birds. The dots on, so on, your, on your migration pathways map. I think those dots probably represent population centers. Um, should I go back to it to see? <laughs> well, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to do it other than this. One of your first, well, yeah. The, that might be the easiest way. Otherwise, you have to exit all the way out. Yeah. So the white dots versus the black dots, since they're, yeah. Um, I, I think the black is just to represent, show where the US is. And they're, I believe they're probably population centers, or it may be um, some of the destinations for some of the migrants. I'm honestly. Can't. But it's interesting. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it looks like the only black dots are in the US. US. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so maybe it's just like native US. <clears throat> But it might be it might be migratory destinations as well because all of those marks are where we see uh, birds flying and and raising babies and spending winters. <laughs> yes, I have. Someone asked, um, "What's the best way to approach a neighbor who runs a very bright LED driveway light all night?" And I think we'd all would love the the. <laughs> the real answer to that right it's hard and that's what a lot of problems is are come from whenever um you know we see problems and um you know just educating people usually is the best way to solve those problems in my experience is just letting people know that you know there are alternatives that you know won't be harmful um of course doing it in a very um nice neighborly way is the the best approach there I, Miranda, I have been thinking about the same thing because <clears throat> I 
<clears throat> have a neighbor that's not on the street next to me. It's the street behind me, two houses over that has a spotlight that shines in my bedroom window. And I'm thinking maybe of writing just a nice little note and saying, would you mind just redirecting that light down? Um, so I, I don't have an answer, but maybe, maybe we can get some creative minds together and come up with a real neighborhood friendly note that we could put on people's doors. There we go. Yeah, because and, and you never know, like maybe that letter would make them realize that something was happening that they didn't even know about and they might feel bad about it. And, and another thing, if any of you are in the news media business, we could get somebody to do something on the danger to our human health with night lights. <laughs> so. All right, so. There are lots of just like general bird questions. Um, I know that I've seen um, related to light pollution, kind of these kind of mass um, bird landings, especially in like parking lots that are lit at night. Um, and you know, where they think it's like a body of water or something like that. And uh, is it, do you know of any kind of legislation that, you know, is, because of course they're always parking lots for these huge corporations. Um, no, the, the better thing to do when you find a situation like that would be to talk to the building owner or the shopping uh, center's manager and just explain some of the things that we've gone over um, to talk about um, some of the issues with birds. Most people, simply do not understand or know what lights do. We all think that they are our safety protector, protectors at night and science studies and research studies have shown that lights are not preventing crime even in major cities. Um, so it's not that, it's just that people simply do not understand and know that lights have some detrimental factors. Uh, we're just so accustomed to them. And, and it's also the color of lights, the blue, blue lights that are in the street lights as opposed to the other softer lights make a difference. Um, and there's a vast amount of information out there available. So if you just search on light bulb colors and human health, you will find tons of information. So if you're putting in outdoor lights or you have to have outdoor lights for some reason, you definitely want to avoid the, bu the bluer tint and go for the warmer, more reddish tint. That's better for wildlife health and, and people people's health. And I know I have a, my big light outside is motion activated. So it only lasts a few minutes when it comes on. So it's useful when it's useful. <laughs> right. And it's off the rest of the time. All right, and if you don't mind, they're just kind of some general bird um, bird questions, um, you know, uh, mainly about, you know, birds in their backyard and how to attract birds in your backyard with bird feeders. And obviously like, do you have any like miracle anti-squirrel bird feeders? <laughs> <clears throat> there are some weighted bird feeders that squirrels cannot get into, but uh, sometimes they learn how to use them, sometimes they don't. Um, but there's not a good answer for that for anyone. And, and I guess we all need to learn how to um, just be okay with some of the other critters that eat our bird food. I looked out my window this morning, I had six squirrels eating the food I have on the ground. So I'm right there with you that it'd be nice for some of the other neighbors to feed the birds so that the squirrels will also eat from their yards. But right now it seems like I'm the, uh, the best restaurant in town. So. We're, we're managing to hold our squirrels at bay at our feeder right now, but what we, we had a squirrel proof feeder that the squirrels figured out how to use. So what we did was take that feeder and hang it on a tall um, metal post that's about oh, six feet off the ground. Um, and we had to make sure that there were no branches hanging overhead that the squirrels could jump from. And then on the bottom of the post, we had to put one of those squirrel baffles. That's just like a big wide canister that keeps the squirrel from climbing up the pole. So, um, and so far they haven't been able to crack this one, um, except maybe one, one squirrel one time. Yeah, 
So some of the bird seed stores in town have lots of uh, baffles and things and quite a few of them do work. So just you have to check around. Yep, or you just, you know, spend more money on feeding the birds and the squirrels. <laughs> right. <laughs> more trips to the bird feeder to refill it. So. All right, so. Um, so Anna wants to know, how do birds use the Earth's magnet magnetic field to help them migrate and prepare for migration? Well, I was afraid somebody was going to ask that because I did a lot of reading about that. And the way, the best way I can describe my understanding, which I'm not going to say is exactly right, is that going north and south, um, some of the thing, some of the light and is polarized, so it's flatter. So it would guide you, guide the birds north and south. And then as the as the um, poles and magnetic magnetic pull goes toward the poles, it goes down to the earth again. And so it, what might be high starts to go down. And as birds themselves start to go down at various positions, say from Raleigh to um, somewhere in Canada, the magnetic pull would be different. So that would help them locate where they're supposed to be. So there, uh, as Lena explained, they, they're using the magnetic field as a compass. And what happens if they are unable to see the stars at night and the sun's already gone down and they can't see the moon if it's cloudy, then they can rely on that magnetic compass to kind of help them keep on target. That's a much better description, Mary. Thank you. No, we wrapped it all together. You, you, you covered all the details. <laughs> All right, and um, another kind of, well, here's a question. Um, does Wake Audubon ever speak to city planners or um, city council against clear cutting of trees in Wake County? We have not, to my knowledge, gotten into the tree issue. We have talked with the city council and the sustainability manager about lights out for city owned buildings um, and um, we will be continuing that conversation um, for lights, but um, there are, I would suggest that the, that you call the city planning office and ask about trees in Raleigh because that also concerns me, but there are some restrictions that are beyond the city's ability to monitor, and I'm not quite sure what all those rules are, but I do know that there are some state guidelines as well as city guidelines. And so um, it is a big issue. I think we're losing a lot of trees in Raleigh. So. And I, I, yeah, I remember that being one of my favorite things about Raleigh when I first moved here um, 15 years ago is, you know, my dad drove by and he said, there's so many trees, I can't tell where I'm going. Like, <laughs> <laughs> You must be from a state with very few trees or- Well, I'm just, I'm from North Carolina, but I, you know, it's one of those like pull off the road and get gas and fast food on your way down the highway kind of town. So yeah, it's, you know, the, the city is very much like strip malls <laughs> and stuff like that. But um, uh, yeah, it's, you know, some of the road work they've been doing when we drive by, I'm like, I don't even recognize where I am anymore. There are no trees left, but uh, yeah. Um, my, my yard is full of lots of trees. Um, and uh, I had a kind of a, a question. I know that um, one of your tips, Mary, was to, if you have plants inside near a window to move them farther away from the window. Of course, you know, it's been a big thing in the quarantine during the pandemic to like get more house plants, right? So it's, it's become a hobby for a lot of people. So I think people probably have a lot of plants in front of their windows. Um, could putting like plants on the other side, like outside of the window, like some kind of shrub or something growing near your house, do you think that would kind of help deter birds or is that a good window to hang a bird feeder in front of, for example? Yes. Oh yeah. Um, if you can get a bird feeder within about three feet of the window, um, that makes a huge difference. Uh, we've got a window feeder on one of our sets of windows and we, we don't have issues with birds trying to fly through the window. Sometimes the bird will try and land on the window, but that's about it. Um, 
And for people with house plants, of course, you want to have your house plants in the window because they need light. Um, so that's another problem. But uh, during migration, you can do things just like closing the curtains, um, putting things on the window, like I said, uh, like a window screen, um, or you can use tempura paint. Um, we treated one of my mom's windows recently. That was a problem for birds. And we just put rows of little tiny dots all the way back and forth across the window, uh, spaced about two inches by four inches. And I haven't heard of any bird problems since then. Yeah, I got, we got new windows in part of our house. The rest of them were very clear. And I think the birds could see that it was like a house because they're really old windows. <laughs> and, um, but the new windows are much more reflective. You know, I think for energy, savings. Um, and I had like a bird strike and a bird died on my sidewalk. And so I immediately got very paranoid <laughs> like went around making changes to my upstairs windows. Um, Cause there are, we have lots of trees around my house, like I said. So I, I think that probably prevented, you know, the birds getting really fast, but um, you know, in the fall when all the leaves were gone, I think it was flying a little bit too fast. So um, that was a, a stressful day for me. <laughs> yeah, I felt very guilty. <laughs> Well, good for you for doing something about it. That's that's what we're trying to get everyone to do. Right. If you see the problem, take action. And that's usually the answer, right? Miranda, I saw one question come across. Mm -hmm. Does migration occur all the time? And not in North Carolina. We have pretty seasonal migrations. We have spring and we have fall. <clears throat> excuse me, that does not mean that they're not birds also moving. For example, right now, there are already migratory shorebirds passing through eastern North Carolina. But here in the Piedmont, it usually is from March to May in the spring. Um, so turn out your lights uh, when spring migration really gets started here in Raleigh. Uh, and in the fall, it's usually the middle of September until about early November. In general, that's when the highest uh, movement is. And so we have um, Shauna who says um, they are in Canada and the Canada geese left in the fall. And um, they wanna know, do the geese go to South America or um, do, where do those Canada geese go? And I think some of us probably, <laughs> no, where some of those Canada geese are. <laughs> North Carolina is a big destination for an awful lot of Canada geese. We have Madam Skeet National Wildlife Refuge and Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge, along with a lot of uh, lakes uh, in eastern North Carolina. So we have a lot of, of migratory geese um, that come there, uh, also in Virginia. Um, but I think North Carolina is probably on the southern limit of the Canada's um, migratory area. Um, we have a number of um, resident Canada geese, so it's hard for us to tell what's a resident and what's a migrant um, because all through the Raleigh Piedmont area, if there's a lake around, uh, we probably have um, we probably have a lot of geese um, that are residents so. Yes, my toddlers love the resident Canada geese. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw a question earlier I wanted to take a shot at. Someone asked if eagles could see glass. And while they do have eyes in the front of their head um, and they've got you know good depth perception, kind of like we do, uh, I'm sure you've all seen videos on the internet of a person walking into a nice clean glass door. Um, just because you can see well doesn't mean that you're going to be able to see the glass until it's there. And that's not a, that works for both people and eagles as well as smaller birds. And we had a question just pop up. Um, are some species in North Carolina more affected by migration than others? I guess, um, I don't know, clear if you mean um, by the danger, some of the issues that migrating birds um, are encountering now. Yeah, uh, what do you think, Lena? 
So I guess, I mean, um, maybe a good way to, like, a, maybe if I'll rephrase that question and say, um, you know, uh, Mary, you mentioned that you found more of some species than others, and that in general, migrating birds have um, a bigger issue with window strikes just because they are not familiar with the area. Um, so are there, are there species of birds that you kind of see a really higher levels of um, in North Carolina that are more endangered by these issues? Mm, well, uh, like well, I read off, like some of the species that we were getting a lot of were, um, oh, I have to click back to my notes. Common yellow throats. Common yellow brush. throat. We had um, cuckoos. Um, which we didn't even know flew through Raleigh until we found them. Right. Yeah. So, but let me let me tell you a story. Maybe this will be a good way to, to close. Um, wood thrush is another one that has a fairly high incidence of bird strikes. Um, and there is a banding station in Nicaragua and Audubon has done some work with them, Audubon, North Carolina. Um, I was fortunate enough to visit that banding station on an Audubon trip a number of years ago. And there was a wood thrush that was banded down there. <clears throat> and there is a big story about it with the woman holding the wood thrush, the bander holding the wood thrush in her hand. And um, cover story for Audubon's magazine, or at least a, a picture story inside the magazine. And a couple of years later, um, somebody in Pennsylvania said, reported that they had a wood thrush that had hit a window and that it had a band on its leg. And they picked it up, someone from Audubon in that area picked it up and they identified it. It was the bird that the bander in Nicaragua had held in her hand and that had had a picture of it that hit a window in Pennsylvania. So it's a, it, when you think about how far that bird had to fly to hit that window, it's a pretty sad thing. But at the same time, um, it's interesting to be able to track where some of these birds have come and gone. So we know birds are, are flying for thousands and thousands of miles. Um, and again, it's a matter of passing through with all the, you know, the magnetic field, the lights, the predators, the windows, <laughs> all of those things come together to make it a really difficult thing. And it's just amazing when you think about how many birds safely do it year after year. So. And it's, it's the small birds that are having the problem, the small songbirds. Yes, yeah. Great. So I think to wrap it up, you know, look around your house, see what you can do to help, get involved with your city council and uh, find out who owns the big buildings that have problems and send them a message, right? That's right. If you work in a big building, talk to the, to, to the building manager. Absolutely. We, we had a list of links people could go check out. Did those get put in the chat or get I, passed around? They did. Um, I think we can repost them now. So if you want to um, copy these links, um, we will also send out an email to all of the registered um, participants with those links included in it, just so you have access to them later. Um, and again, um, all of our presentations are being recorded and Hugo is going to um, drop a link to our YouTube playlist where they are being uploaded um, daily. And so um, check that out. If you have missed a presentation or just want to check one out again, um, you can go to YouTube and watch those. They will also, we will post the links on the registration, the program page on astronomy days um, on naturalsciences.org. And let me see if I can take over the screen share from you. See, did that work? Yes. So I want to thank um, Mary and Lena. Thank you so much for um, talking about this. It was so fun to hear about birds, um, even though it's astronomy days, right? And so I think it's everything's connected. And um, you know, if we have less lights on at night, then um, we're helping the birds, and we can see more stars. And there is nothing wrong with that, right? Um, so thank you all for coming. I want to thank. 
um, NC Space Grant for sponsoring Astronomy Days, including our closed captioning. And you can head over to Astronomy Days website at naturalsciences.org. We have these specially designed t-shirts um, designed by the museum. Um, you can pick up a t-shirt or a zip hoodie and you can sign up for lots of more programs coming throughout the week. It's only Tuesdays. So we have a ton of more programs um, all the way through Sunday. So make sure you sign up for those. Again, thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Lena and Mary, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you.